Be turning in your Bibles to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 1. That's where we'll be for the majority of our time this morning. How well do y'all know your memory verse? (laughs) This is the last Sunday in January, but we have been discussing walk worthy of the calling from Ephesians 4 and verse 1. If you don't mind saying this with me. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Next Sunday night, we're going to discuss a a very important topic, although it will be very in-depth and challenging not to discourage you from attending. But we will discuss the canon of Scripture. What about the lost books of the Bible? We'll discuss that next Sunday evening at 6 p.m. if everything goes according to plan this next week. And so please, please make efforts to be here. That will be an opportunity for you to invite somebody. It will be an opportunity for you to learn about some things you may not be aware of. And so I think it will be a worthwhile lesson as we consider some very important things about our book we call the Bible. There are a few men here today wearing gray, and if you didn't get the the memo that you were supposed to wear gray today, it's because you're not on the text thread, okay? So if you want to be included in that, and I'm kidding, that was a total joke, but I did notice, I couldn't help but notice, it was like you bought a red car and everybody all of a sudden is driving red cars. Well, there was a bunch of people in gray suits today, and I can recognize gray even though I am very colorblind. So I appreciate your being here this morning. The lesson this morning is not necessarily going to be a traditional approach in my normal way of preaching lessons. I don't have a one, two, three, take this home and do something with it. This is going to be a little bit more graphic and a little bit more exhaustive in some ways maybe, but I hope that what it does is challenges you. It challenges you to think about some things that you perhaps take for granted. Even Roger on the table this morning made reference to the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. We call him that. Several places in the New Testament reinforce that idea and reinforce that concept that Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice. But do we really stop and appreciate what that even means? The depth of that expression. I I want us to start by reading this particular passage. This is Leviticus 1, Leviticus chapter 1. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priest, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron... The priest shall put the fire on the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. Then the priest, Aaron's son, shall lay the parts, the head, and the fat in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water, and the priest shall burn all on the, on the altar as a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. If his offering is of the flocks, of the sheep, or of the goats, as a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring a male without blemish. He shall kill it on the north side of the altar before the Lord and the priests, Aaron's sons, shall sprinkle its blood all around on the altar and he shall cut it into pieces with its head and its fat and the priests shall lay them in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash the entrails and the legs with water. Then the priests shall bring it all and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And if the burnt sacrifice of his offering to the Lord is of the birds... 
Then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or young pigeons. The priest shall bring it to the altar, wring off its head, and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out on the side of the altar, and he shall remove its crop with its feathers and cast it beside the altar on the east side into the place for ashes. Then he shall split it at its wings, but shall not divide it completely. And the priest shall burn it on the altar on the wood that is on the fire. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Being that we are so far removed from both that system and that culture in time, much of that is quite lost on us. We read through it and we can pick up certain things or certain methods or expressions and we recognize it. We can see the language that's employed and some of it is quite graphic as it details this particular process. This is a place where daily Bible reading goes to die. When you look through Genesis, we can read through the stories. We talked about Joseph this morning in class. When you begin Exodus, you can read through it and it's quite easy to get. It gets a little tougher in the discussions about the tabernacle. But then Leviticus gets here and we, we quit. I have a passion for books like Leviticus. I was assigned to teach this several years ago and had never really appreciated the book before. There's a lot in this book that is tough for us to understand. But I will submit to you, without an understanding of Leviticus, you cannot understand truly and appreciate truly the work of Jesus Christ. In fact, several of those expressions that I referred to earlier, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, we don't appreciate that if we don't stop first and appreciate Leviticus, especially chapter 16, although chapter 1 is implied too. So often we think about the Levitical sacrifices and we don't necessarily break them up. We, we, we lump them together, it's one particular thing. But folks, when you read Leviticus 1 through 7, you'll find that this was a very strenuous system. It was full of not just one sacrifice, but a plethora of sacrifices. The burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the restitution offering, the heave offering, the wave offering, and it goes on and on and on. And what we don't expect or what we don't appreciate and stop and reflect upon is that Jesus Christ replaced that. Folks, He is the perfect sacrifice because of what He accomplished in His specific offering. This particular book is a detailing of how to maintain a relationship with God under that old system. This was a book given to them so that they could maintain their societal and governmental restrictions that all fed into their religion because it was a theocracy. It was wrapped up in the fact that God was king. Not just God, He was king. And the people had to maintain a covenant with Him. And so while several of this, several parts of this discussion are lost on us and several parts of it don't specifically apply to us, Folks, it is incredibly important that we at least understand parts of it and we appreciate all of it. I want to give you just a few things I want you to chew on as we go through the lesson. The way this particular structure begins in Leviticus 1, it actually sets the stage for all the sacrifices that follow it. Going all the way through chapter 6 and I believe verse 13, all of these are set in structure after Leviticus 1, after the burnt sacrifice. And if you'll notice, it begins with the bull, and then it progresses to the smaller, cheaper items. It has the bull, and then it has the flocks. It has the goats and the sheep, and then it goes into the turtle doves and the pigeons. It's because it, it progresses from a very expensive sacrifice down to a very cheap sacrifice. The idea is... Stated in the beginning of chapter 1, when any man, anyone, brings an offering to God. The point being, God would accept anyone's sacrifice as long as it was, listen very carefully, it was the best they could offer. God would accept it. The heart is where God was looking. 
Not just the pocketbook, the heart. And that is the exact same it is, as it is today. He looks at the heart of the matter. And so he expects nothing less than the best you can offer and he will ask no more than the best you can offer. But that's what he expects. The very best. And you see that throughout Leviticus. And that pattern follows into chapter 2 through 7. His expectations are very clear. When you read through this section, the parameters for acceptable worship are detailed in Leviticus chapter 1. And it continues in that pattern through the next several chapters. God tells exactly what He wants and what He expects from His covenantal people is to do it, to keep it, to uphold their end of the covenant. One of the themes of Leviticus is God is holy. And His people are called to be holy as well. This book details how they maintain that holiness. And it is through reverence for Him and His will and keeping to it. Leviticus details that for us. Please keep in mind the regularity of these sacrifices. Morning and evening they offered these and even more on holy days. And as we're picking through this, I want you to appreciate something. The absolute perfection in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I hope that what this does is causes you to ponder how rich a sacrifice Jesus really gave. How perfect it truly was and how absolute and eternal it is. A deeper reverence for Him is the goal of our discussion this morning. What we're going to do is go through the process of this particular sacrifice, really detailing verses 1 through 9. I wanted to to start right here with the picture that's on the board. Being that we are so far removed from this society and from this culture, we don't always stop and appreciate the tabernacle itself. When Israel made camp, and if you wanted to look at the historical aspect of this, after the tabernacle is built and it is erected, Moses' day or even into Joshua's day as the conquest of Canaan takes place and the tabernacle comes to rest at Shiloh. This is what it looked like. It was camped, and when Israel camped around it, they they camped in tribes around it, north, south, east, and west. And at the center of the camp was the tabernacle itself. I think in many ways that was symbolic of the fact that God was the center of who these people were supposed to be. As if a hub with the spokes of the wheel around it. The people camped around God's tabernacle. He was the center of who these people were. When you approach the tabernacle, that's what you saw. You walked through the droves of people to the tabernacle of God to approach Him in His place. I want us to start with verses 2 and 3. Leviticus chapter 1 The first process in this sacrifice was actually the selection of the animal. This is verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel. By the way, that's Moses being given information by God, from God, from the tabernacle of meeting. God sets the parameters. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. I want you to just stop and think about what goes into this process. They had to choose the animal. They had to go and pick an animal that had to be without spot and without blemish. Now, I don't think that that happened... Overnight, I don't think that that was just a spur of the moment. Well, today's time to go worship God. Today's time to go offer sacrifice. Let me just any, many, many, mo. No, this is an animal without spot and without blemish. So this animal has to be nurtured and prepared for this day. And I think in many cases, the idea is that they they prepared a particular animal for this occasion. You don't just wake up and accidentally have one ready to go. This was an animal picked and prepared and planned for this day, for this offering, without spot and without blemish. That means this is a male bull, which is the only way a bull comes, by the way. But it is a male bull that is intact, that has all of his parts 
that is without spot and without blemish. That matters when we get to later discussion here. Now, I want you to appreciate what goes into that. This creature, if it gets one bad cut on it, it's no good anymore. In fact, God later in the Minor prophet says, quit bringing me that junk. I don't want it. You're bringing me the lame and the crippled and the sick and the blind. I don't want those sacrifices. You know, I raised livestock. And sometimes they would get up to good size on their own without being hurt, but I had on multiple occasions times where livestock were in a pasture by themselves or three or four head together in one particular pasture and oh no, they step in a hole, bum a knee, and then have a knot on their leg. You ever had a dog do that? You ever had a dog by himself, nothing wrong, nothing stirs him up, but he gets hurt. One knot on a leg, one cut on a foot, and it's no longer without spot and without blemish, folks. This was something they put thought into. This is something they prepared to do. By the way, folks, that's how Jesus is described. The Lamb of God that was without spot and without blemish, folks, He was the perfect sacrifice that God prepared for us. It does beg the question, folks. How much thought do you put in our worship? How much time do you, do you spend preparing? Curtis did an excellent job this morning. Psalm 19. Did you read it before we came together? Did, did you put any thought, any time, any effort into coming to worship God? Or was it just kind of a haphazard throw-together thing just 30 or so minutes before time for services to begin? Is that the best we can offer? How much thought did you give on Tuesday about what we were going to do here Sunday? Folks, this is something. They, they didn't just accidentally stumble into worship of God. They didn't just, wow, all of a sudden I fell into a worship to God that's acceptable before Him. No. Time. Effort thought went into this particular discussion. After the animal was chosen, in the same couple of verses, it was brought to the tabernacle. Look, let's look at verse 2 again. So he says, when, anyone of, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, he shall bring it of, of the livestock of the herd and of the flock. Verse 3, if his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will. Notice this. At the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. So, so this, this, this individual, this worshiper of God, has to then bring this animal to the tabernacle. You know, during the end of Moses' life, that wouldn't have been as difficult while the nation was basically still camped together. But when you get over to Joshua's days, and they have taken Canaan, and they have dispersed the land... We're talking about a long travel to the tabernacle. In fact, in some cases, if you're in the northernmost part of Canaan, northernmost part of Israel, it may have been as far as 100 miles that they're traveling to the place to worship God. And yet they do. Remember that, that approach to the tabernacle. This place of God's worship. This place where His most holy place is where the glory of God fills the most holy place. And the Ark of the Covenant, that was an incredible thing to approach. And as they approach it, they're walking through a sea of their peers. They're walking through a, the nation of Israel. And during the day, there's the pillar of cloud. At night, there's the pillar of fire. Can you imagine that approach? All to access God. Further than that, folks, have you ever had to wait in line at the vet with your animal? And the thing is, he's crawling underneath the chairs, and, and you're trying to drag him out and get him to sit still, and the dog keeps, he's trying to, every time the door opens and the nurse comes out, and, is it nurse? I don't know if it's a, 
a vet tech maybe. But every time the door opens, the dog's trying to bolt and you're trying to keep it contained and, and still because you're waiting to do something. That is a very domesticated animal. <laughs> now in many cases, a lot of these animals probably were very domesticated, which again goes back to the challenge of the first point. An animal that's domesticated, an animal that's easy to handle. You're holding this thing in line and we're not talking about, wow, we're the first one in line at the tabernacle today. Folks, this is a nation of people. This would have been a long line of individuals waiting to do the same thing that you're doing. And all that they have is halters and lead ropes and this temperamental male creature. You know, I had livestock you couldn't put in pens together. Because if you did, they'd fight. You ever had dogs do that? Can't put these dogs together because you know they're going to fight. Maybe it's your dog and it's a cousin's dog that comes over and visits. You can't put them together, they're going to fight. Folks, animals are like that. And yet these people had to bring this animal to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to worship God. Traveling in some ways 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles on foot to bring this worship, to bring this sacrifice before God. What do you think they spoke about the whole way there and the whole way home? Imagine those conversations between family. What kind of conversations do you have about what we're doing here? I, I have known far too many people that grew up at, in Christian households that fell away from the Lord, and I'll tell you the contributing, or at least a contributing factor, was the fact that mom and dad griped about worship the whole way home. It took too long. The song leader led 14 songs. In fact, we led every song this morning. had four verses, which was perfect for the discussion and illustration. And the whole way home, mom and dad are griping about how long it took. Did, let me ask you this. Did you have to wait in line for a few hours to worship God? Maybe I should say this bluntly. Get over it. <laughs> when they brought their sacrifice before God, they brought it before the door of the tabernacle of meeting to approach God in His holiness with this animal that was without spot and without blemish when they began their journey. You ever stopped and thought about what happens if they make the journey and the animal stumbles as you're coming into Shiloh? <laughs> Bump, there goes the knee. All that effort out the window. Maybe they can train. Maybe they can can trade the the animal with a bum leg now for something that's got a little bit better physique. All this so that they can approach God in His holiness. And all that all this time, what they're seeing again is that pillar of cloud, and, and, and beside it, they're seeing the smoke from the altar. If you've never been to a, a livestock auction, which I have been to more of those things that I could begin to tell you about. But if you've ever been to a livestock auction, a place where they buy and sell livestock, the sounds are deafening, especially if you go into the back. The smells, you smell a livestock barn when you drive by it. Folks, this is what we're looking at here. A place where thousands of people come to worship God, a place where thousands of sacrifices are made. This was no simple matter. The next process, verse 4, Leviticus 1, verse 4. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. Please understand who he's talking about. This is the worshiper. This is the individual who brought the sacrifice, the individual who chose this particular animal, the individual who then brought it to the tabernacle. Now he, or she is laying their hands on the head of this creature. More than likely at this point, they actually are, are telling why they're here because as I said a moment ago, there was a whole plethora of sacrifices and so just because they brought this particular animal doesn't necessarily mean it's for burnt offerings. It may have been for a peace offering, in which case different parts of it ended up on the altar and different parts ended up, ended up in the priest pile. But either way, they explain what they're doing here so that they can make atonement for their sins. This creature that they had raised, they had nurtured, they had led to the tabernacle, folks. Now, they're laying their hands on the head of this creature. You don't get to pass it off. It's you looking it in the eye. 
It's you. The same one who cared for it. The same one who nurtured it. The same one who put all that effort into making sure it was without spot and without blemish. And now you, you are the one laying your hands on the head of the animal. Even if you take an animal that's somewhat domesticated, at this point in the process, you're probably going to tie it down. Because I don't care how gentle this creature is, with some of the other things you've got to do to it in a moment, you're going to have to tie it down. You're going to have to bind it. I made the comment years ago when I talked through this material, I imagine there were some times where at the tabernacle you could see a pretty good rodeo. Because they had to take this creature and lay it down so that they could lay their hands on it and then proceed to the next step. Look at, look at verse 4 again. Verse 4. He shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering. That is the worshiper. It will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. Verse 5. He shall kill the bull before the Lord. He shall kill the bull before the Lord. That's still the worshiper. So again, this creature you have prepared for this particular purpose, now you're killing it. It's your hands on the knife that's at the throat of this creature. You've got to kill. You don't get to just pass this off to the priest. Well, let him do it. Let him do this because we're in the tabernacle and now it should be him anyways. No, no, no. You don't get to hand this off. It's you. And when this animal starts struggling, because that's what happens when you cut an animal's throat, it's struggling because you sinned. The whole time, what's going through your head, or at least what was supposed to be going through your head, my sin did this. My sin. It's the reason your hands are on the head of the animal. It's the reason you're having to kill it. My sin did this. Folks, that is a personal thing. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. I believe that in some ways that's, that's part of the challenge we have today with looking at the sacrifice of Christ. We've made it so generic. We've made it so general. Well, yeah, he died for the world. No, he died for you. Amen. This was a personal thing. And when his blood was shed, it was because I have sinned. Not just because everybody sinned. Folks, he truly was the perfect sacrifice. He was the, the lamb without spot and without blemish that died to take away my sin. Don't trivialize this. And don't lose sight of the fact that the, the, the simple truth taught in the story of Leviticus is that sin is a bloody, graphic mess. We would do well to reflect on that. We would do well to reflect on, don't choose that old path. In fact, that's so, many, so many times that's the plea in the New Testament is don't go back to the old man because you're, you're wasting the sacrifice of Jesus. When you go and read Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 and following, he says, don't go on sinning willfully. He said, if you do, you're trampling the blood of Christ underfoot. This is what it's talking about. The blood that was shed. The lamb that had to be killed so we could make atonement for our Sins. At this point in the procedure, the priest then gets involved. Notice this, Leviticus 1, verse 5, he says, He shall kill the bull before the Lord. And the priest, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So here now we get the priest involved. At this point in the procedure, the worshiper is having to do most of the work. But because this blood, of, or where this blood is about to be taken, the priest has to get involved because the priest has to catch this blood, and we're going to find out in just a minute what he does with it. Worshiper couldn't do that. I'm going to tell you something, folks. This was a messy ordeal. And here's this priest. Go read the garments of the priest. Go read about the garments of the priest in the later chapters of Exodus. This person who represents God to the people this person who makes intercession between the people and God, this individual clothed in white and looks holy and looks without spot and without blemish, and now that's no longer the case because atonement must be made. 
Here stands the priest carrying the blood to make atonement for you. You can't make intercession for yourself. And again, please see the connection to Christ who is both sacrificed and priest. The worshiper then skins and cuts up this creature. Down in verse 6. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. Again, now he's switching back and forth, responsibilities and roles, but it's very clear which is which and who has the job. So now the worshiper takes this creature that they just killed and now they're going to cut it up and they're going to skin it. Now I know we've got some hunters in here. That's with a little 80 pound doe. And no, it wasn't a 180 pound buck. Don't even start lying to me. But, but with that little 100 pound doe, it's a little bit of work, isn't it? Now imagine, now imagine this creature. They're having to take and skin this creature. And no, they're not hoisting it up with the John Deere tractor. No, they're, they're not laying it to the side and they're taking their sawzall and running down. No, no, no. That, that, it's a knife and they're on the ground. You know, this was back-breaking work. This wasn't a check-the-box religion, folks. This wasn't a just knock it out, get it over with, let's go home. No, this is back-breaking, exhaustive work. Now, as a future comment, have you ever skinned something? Gotten blood and hair all over you? By the way, all you deer hunters, even if you don't do the job yourself, which I recognize very few people do, you handle the carcass, you're going to get hair on you. The whole time, the worshiper's dusting himself off, trying to get that blood off his hands, trying to get the hair off of his hands. And, and either he's going to travel home with it on him still, or he's going to try to find the first water hole to clean off. And the reminder is, the whole time he's doing it, my sin did this. What, what do you think goes through his mind as he goes back home on his journey? With the minimum of a halter and lead rope. You ever had to take a dog to the vet to be put down? Does it not impact you a little bit to take the leash in with the dog? And when you leave the clinic, you're just holding the leash? Folks, the whole journey home, the worshiper's carrying a halter and lead rope with no animal. And the thought through his head, my sin did this. My sin did this. Not a check the box, not get it over with. My sin did this. The priest then builds the altar under the fire. That's a little bit of a misnomer. What he does is restokes the fire. Notice down in verse 7. The sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar and lay wood in order on the fire. Now again, that sounds a little bit like what he does is starts the fire and builds it up, but as we read later in the, in the book of Leviticus in chapter 6, and again I believe in chapter 9, the fire under this altar is actually started by God in chapter 9, verse 24 I believe, as God starts the, or he accepts the first sacrifice. The priest's job then, and it's stated three times in chapter 6, is don't let the fire go out. So the priest's job, or at least one of the priest's jobs, was to continually stoke this fire. It could not burn out, and I think some way symbolism was, God made a covenant with these people, and as long as they upheld their end of it, He would remain in covenant with them, so they had to continually stoke the fire. You ever stopped and thought about how hot that fire must have been? You ever been around a bonfire? You, you, you take a small campfire, and you can feel the heat off of it five, ten feet away. A small campfire is not going to burn a carcass. Folks, this was a fire that was roaring and raging. This was a fire that had to burn so hot that it could take care of the business they're about to put on to it. And the priest had his job to make sure it never goes out. 
The priest then takes the animal parts. Look at verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. Then the priest, Aaron's son, shall lay the parts, the head, and the fat in order on the wood that is on the fire on the altar. Again, please notice, it's not the worshiper who gets to approach the altar of God. He can't do it. It's got to be the priest because the worshiper is there because he needs atonement for his sins. And so the priest has to make this intercession before God and man. The priest has to approach the holy things of God. And so he lays these particular parts across this altar. He lays them on the altar that it might be burned up. Still not over. Verse 9, the worshiper then takes and washes the entrails and the legs. Verse 9, but he, that is again the worshiper, but he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water. Are are you seeing in your mind how this process would have unfolded, how this process would have worked, and all the work that goes into it? By the way, please observe, it's always the nasty stuff the worshiper's having to do. The priest there is decorated in his priestly garments. He is supposed to stay as clean as possible. The only thing that's supposed to get on him is the blood. But the worshiper is the one doing all the grunt work. The worshiper is the one who's cutting up all the pieces, who's taking and washing the entrails, that's the guts, and washing the legs, cleaning this creature off, preparing it for the final stage of its sacrifice, of his sacrifice. You don't get to hand off the dirty details, folks. You don't get to pass it off to someone else. It's on you. Worship is personal. You got a weak stomach? I'll confess to you I don't. Because other than the actual sacrifice part, I've done this. You have a weak stomach? Oof! Can I opt out of this and have somebody else do this stuff for me? Can can I back away from it and I'll, well, okay, maybe I'm queasy. My husband can step in and do this gritty, nasty part for me. No, it's you that has to do this. You, You don't get the luxury, folks. You don't get the luxury, folks, of having someone else worship God for you. You do have the luxury of enjoying the sacrifice you didn't have to make. All of these pieces, maybe pun intended, the entrails and legs, all these pieces, they come together, folks, in the sacrifice and work of Jesus Christ. But how often do we stop and think about that? How often do we stop and appreciate that? Oh, and by the way, there's still one last thing that's got to be done. The priest then burns everything except the skin. This is verse 9. And the priest, halfway through verse 9, And the priest shall burn all on the altar as a burnt sacrifice and offering made by fire a sweet aroma to the Lord. And once again, there's a statement there that needs to be understood in the context of Leviticus. Later in chapter 7, nope, chapter 6, sorry, chapter 6, he says don't burn the skin. The priests get the skin of all the burnt sacrifices. But the idea is the entire creature then is put on the altar by the priest again because you can't do it, And he burns it up on the altar so that you can make atonement for your sins. Do you see all the work that went into this? Do you see all the efforts they put forth to maintain holiness? To uphold their end of the covenant? Folks, please appreciate all of these different intricate details and how it interweaves together. Each person knew exactly what they were supposed to do. They wanted to worship God. They wanted to maintain their relationship with God. They wanted to be holy as He is holy, and so here's how they do it. Folks, God went to great lengths to uphold His end of the covenant. He did it with Israel. He does it with us. What we have to do in response is simple. It's insignificant in some ways. Not that it doesn't matter, but I'm saying in comparison. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We don't don't understand and we don't appreciate 
the statement like Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice. He didn't just take away that. He he didn't just take away the burnt sacrifices, the burnt offering. Folks, He took away all of it. He took away the peace offering and the grain offering and the heave offering and the wave offering and the restitution offering. He made the Day of Atonement a reality. All of it pointed to Him. And the better we understand that, the better we're going to understand who He is and what He actually did for us. I'll submit to you, you can't understand the book of Hebrews without some of an understanding of this. In fact, if you want some extracurricular work for bonus points, go read Hebrews chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10 this afternoon. And go see exactly what Jesus did. And we are going to read one of those passages as we kind of wrap up this morning. Hebrews chapter 10, please. Hebrews chapter 10. All the work that went into that sacrifice and yet what it was was a regular, a regular sacrifice. It was a continual sacrifice. In fact, that's how Hebrews 10 begins in some ways. He says there's a sacrifice, there's a reminder of these sins every year. Verse 3. He says, basically, as we already observe in Leviticus, this was a continual thing. It didn't happen one and done. Well, we just get through this one nasty project one time and we don't have to worry about it ever again. No. It was an every single time you transgress God's law problem. And the Hebrew writer shows how that is all resolved in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10 verse 11. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. Again, the idea is going through that whole process all the time, day in, day out for the people. He says, which can never take away sins. But this man, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, one sacrifice for sins, forever he sat down at the right hand of God. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering, He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. One offering. Not a morning and evening. Not a day in and day out. Not another feast day sacrifices. Not a plethora of sacrifices like Solomon did on the day he initiated the temple and thousands of creatures died. No. One. One sacrifice one time because Jesus Christ was the perfect Lamb of God. And only He could take away the sins of the world. Is that something that we chew on? Is that something that we ponder, that we reflect upon? Is that something that we can truly even appreciate in some ways? The work that goes on Behind the scenes, the worship of a God as holy and as awesome as our God. The the meaning behind the statement, Jesus is the initiator of a better covenant. Do you get it? In some ways, how could we? And yet He is. If you are straying right now, if you are a wayward child of the Creator God, we would beg of you to make that known this morning and we can help bring you to the Lamb of God. And if you have been a child of God and have went again into this world, then you understand something that we've discussed this morning. There is no atonement for sin without the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you've left that, you've left it all. Can we help you this morning? We'd ask you to make it known now as we stand and as we sing.